This has been our biggest streaming media connect event yet. Uh, we've had 33 panels, well, 32 this will be over the last six days. And it's not our last streaming media connect. We'll be doing another streaming media connect virtual event in August, but we're going to be following that up with the return to in-person streaming media events in Huntington Beach for Streaming Media West in November. And Steve Nathans Kelly will put the link to that event in the chat. If you're interested in speaking, the call for speakers is open. If you're interested in sponsoring, all the information you need to know about sponsoring will be at that link. As always, all of our sessions will be available in the archives within a day or so of the live broadcast. They'll be at our YouTube channel. Steve will also put that link in the chat. You can also go to the streaming media website and click on the cleverly titled tab called videos and scroll down to conference videos for a link to all of the videos from our virtual and in-person events for the last several years. A couple of housekeeping notes. The chat will be open but we do ask that you put questions for the panelists in the Q&A tab. That's where we'll be looking for them. And it's a lot easier for us to keep track of them if they're all there. And before we jump into our discussion, I'd like to thank our diamond sponsor, Signiant, for helping to make Streaming Media East Connect possible. And we've got a short video message from them now. When the director calls action. And action. When the game is on. It's or it's time to save the universe again. Media Shuttle is there. Trusted by more than 25,000 media companies, Media Shuttle delivers, making it easy and secure to send any size file anywhere fast. The journey begins with Media Shuttle portals, customized and branded for any project and designed to be so easy, your end users will love it. All while giving operations teams complete control through a simple yet powerful admin interface. Add users, set permissions, customize file delivery specs, and report on all activity. Blast off with proprietary acceleration technology. Media Shuttle moves your content anywhere in the internet connected world at hyper speeds. Along the way, your files are protected. Our commitment to enterprise grade security has made Media Shuttle a preferred tool with Hollywood studios, major sports leagues, broadcasters, and more. With Media Shuttle, your files are never handed over to Signiant. File movement is orchestrated between the end user's workstation and your storage, whether on-prem or in the cloud. Your IT team simply provisions your storage, connecting it to the Media Shuttle cloud service, and Signiant handles the rest. Get started on your Media Shuttle journey today, a journey without limits. I would also like to thank our session sponsor for this panel, Metrological. Greg Riker from Metrological will, Metrological will be joining the discussion as we talk about user experiences and user interfaces. Uh, you know, someone once said that if content is king, then user experience is queen. Without getting into the gendered nature of that phrase, I think we'd all agree that user experience is absolutely crucial to help OTT services find success to help them keep customers coming back. If we were having a drinking game right now, uh, the word would be delight, I believe. Um, so keep that in mind. But we've got a great group of panelists here to talk about uh, building great user experiences. And I'd like to have them all introduce themselves as we go around the, the room, so to speak, uh, starting with CJ Harvey from HBO. CJ, or HBO Max, pardon me. I need to be, <laughs> need to be clear about that. Hey there, um, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm the head of product for the entertainment side of the house, so focusing on everything that a, a user sees as their subscriber. Um, that's my role. All right. Greg Riker is head of business development and sales uh, in the Americas for Metrological. Greg, talk a little bit about what you and Metrological do. Yeah, good. Good, good afternoon. Well, we, we have a, a nice little sweet spot in both the, uh, the operator side of the business and the CSP side of the business for the content service providers. You know, we kind of bridge that relationship about, you know, making it a little bit easier for the uh, MVPDs to, you know, get these app stores and these content out to their TVs and their devices. And, and hopefully we've got nice relationships where we can actually help the uh, CSPs and their distribution strategies about bringing their content to, to more subscribers. So we kind of fit right there in the middle as a, as a technology, uh, facilitator and a, uh, and on the business side, more of a uh, content uh, carriage distribution partner. 
Excellent. Uh, Tom, Tom Hurlbut is the Senior Director of Product Manager at Crunchyroll. Tom, tell us a little bit about what you do there. Thanks, Eric. I'm responsible for our content application and social experiences. So uh, in terms of taking, making sure that whether it's a mobile device, whether it's your laptop or whether it's a connected television, that you have the ability to watch all of the anime content that you want to, while also being able to connect with like-minded fans who are just as passionate about the content as you are. Very good. And last but not least, Sharana Math, who is Director of product, uh, Partner Management at Roku. Sharana. Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, I lead the Partner Management team at Roku. It's Roku is the number one streaming platform in the U.S. and uh, pioneered the streaming for all. And, and our founder believes that all TV will be streamed um, someday. I think it's that future is coming very fast. Um, as to my team, we deal with all content partners, um, onboarding of all content partners to Roku platform, uh, be it uh, big partners uh, or small, I think it goes through our team and we help them to come on the platform and be successful on the platform. Very good. And I think from everyone's job titles and responsibilities, you get a sense that this is going to be a big picture look at user experience, everything from user interfaces to uh, marketing channels to social connections. We're going to talk about all of it and hopefully we'll have time to cover everything. But I'd like to start by asking each of you to sort of walk through the user experience, user interface journey from each of your perspectives. So CJ, can we start with uh, HBO Max? Uh, absolutely. Happy to do that. Um, and kind of circling back to your previous point, um, I wonder if we could progress that, that metaphor to say if content is king, then maybe UX is the castle. And if you think about, you know, that castle, sort of where the king lives, um, we could really even walk through kind of that experience, even coming from that first part of your profile picture. And as you're onboarding um, at HBO Max, we make sure that you have a really rich set of character-based IP avatars, as well as the ability to take your own picture and upload that. So you can literally see yourself in our product. Um, we believe that the experience pivots on the user. Um, and that is one of the first moments where we really highlight the level of personalization and personal touch that you'll find throughout the experience. So coming past that profile picker, or if you will, the drawbridge, um, you come in and the first thing that you're greeted with is our immersive hero. I'm really excited to have released that feature late last year, um, timed with Wonder Woman 1984. Um, essentially, it's a large moving image that helps us advance our sort of our storytelling and create a more emotional connection to some of the high profile tentpole pieces on site. Um, and I can tell you that that unit is working twice as hard as many of the other editorial components on page to drive a lot of really rich engagement and get people into content as quickly as possible. Um, in that space, we've actually seen since launch that our time to first playback has dropped in half from 200 seconds down to 100 seconds. Um, we think that our personalized features that you see appear directly below the immersive hero are a really strong driver for that quick time to playback. So the first thing we do is make sure we support habit with a continue watching tray. It picks up where you left off and it'll also bring in other things. So imagine you finished watching John Oliver last season. You don't have to remember when he's coming back and then navigate to the experience to find it. We'll serve that up for you directly below the immersive hero when you come in. Um, right after that, we're using personalized algorithms to support discovering new things. And we have a tray that's titled for you. And that's intended to serve up some of the, that, that intersection of what's new and fresh and also really interesting for you based on your viewing behavior. Um, after that, the homepage you know, feels like a, a normal landing page experience. Um, we celebrate our, um, you know, our, our current releases, things that have just been added to the platform. Um, there's obviously you know, uh, editorial moments that we pull in there. We bring in themed trays that have entry points into our brand hubs so that people get to see all of the diverse brands and the breadth of the catalog in that way. Um, and everything sort of in that middle to end of page is a little bit of our brand promise of handcrafted by humans and powered by technology. So we've got a really brilliant set of editorial um, folks coming up with these collections and trays, but then we actually use technology to figure out which users see them in which viewing occasions. So we're matching up you know, your preference with that optimal viewing time that you'd be likely to engage with something. 
Um, coming all the way down to the page, we end things on that homepage with a trade called Last Chance. Um, we're somewhat noted in, in the blogs and in the media for being very transparent about when things come to our platform and when they're going away. You don't have to go and do a bunch of searches offline to figure out what the window periods are for, for content that you'd like to see. We wanna be very clear with our users so that they have the best experience possible and always know what they're going to expect. Um, so that last chance piece is, is one part of our strategy around that clarity of, of temporal categories on the platform. You'll also find things like coming soon and that's uh, merchandise with trailers that you can watch to get excited about before something comes um, just added. And then of course, we also have a trending now section that highlights things that have sort of uh, the, the largest jump in viewership uh, one time period versus the next. Um, I think that's probably a pretty good microcosm of all the things that we do at HBO Max, just looking at the homepage. Um, does that kind of answer your question? That's really great. And I, I really like the uh, user experience is the castle uh, rather than the queen. Uh, at some point, we're going to have to address what's in the dungeon, but maybe we can we can get to that in, in a little bit. Um, Tom, could you talk about the, the user experience journey with Crunchyroll? Sure. So similar to what CJ mentioned with HBO Max, um, there's a lot that we do in terms of being able to curate both programmatic and human curated content to our users to be able to not only be able to help those users who aren't quite sure you know, what type of content may, that's available given that they may have come because of a huge hit like Attack on Titan, but also be able to provide thematically and seasonally appropriate content that helps even the most seasoned fan to be able to come and rediscover content that they may have put on the back burner or had watched before and forgotten and would love to get back into. As, as much as we talk about content as like the, the you know, king of the uh, realm itself, mm -hmm. There are also two aspects of the user experience that we really do focus on Crunchyroll. One is immediacy, the other is community. Um, given that a lot of the content that we have available airs on the site itself right after it airs in Japan, there is an anticipation to be able to get access to the content the moment it becomes live, to the point where people start getting anxious if like five minutes after the broadcast it's not available and they're starting to add our Twitter handle going, hey, I got to have it. When, when's it going to come out on the site itself? So a lot of what we do is meeting that expectation with our users in terms of having access to the content, not only when it airs, but also being able to meet them on the touch point itself, whether that be on the website, whether that be a mobile device, or whether that be connected TV itself. In addition, as much as the content is very important, what's as important and maybe sometimes even more important is the community around the, the actual um, anime uh, group itself in the sense that the end of an episode is not the end, but rather the beginning of a week-long obsession in terms of what just happened, the consequences of what happened, all of the theories, uh, theorizing that's going to happen in terms of what happened to be able to get people excited for what's going to come a week later. And that a lot of what we focus on is being able to not only get people access to that content, but also be able to connect them with other people who are just excited about the content as they are, to be able to share in that passion, be able to drive a deeper connection to the content than if they were just watching by themselves. It was bound to happen sooner or later that I'd leave my mute on. Sharana, what about at Roku? Thanks, Steve. Um, at, at, at Roku, I think as a platform, we sort of focus on three you know, key pillars when it comes to user experience, right? It's about ease of using the platform, the value uh, that we give to the consumers, and then the choice we give to the consumers. You know, we want to make sure the streaming experience is as easy as possible uh, for our you know, 53 million or so active accounts and consumers. Uh, we want to help them find what they want as quickly as possible. When it comes to value, you know, one third of US households have cut the card. And one of the primary reasons they have cited is the saving uh, money is, uh, is, is one of the primary reasons. And then finally, on the choice part of it, I think it's about providing that choice to consumers access what they want, when they want, at their convenience. And uh, also, you know, at times they look for free content and Roku channel offers a great way for them to access it. In addition to this, 
I think at an app level, at an each content owner level, um, we categorize sort of the user journey into three main buckets, right? One, first one is um, onboarding experience. Like how does that look like? That includes figuring out where the content is, where the channels are to how they sign up and then how they create that profile as CJ mentioned and then how that uh, experience works for them. And then when it comes to the navigation aspect of it, it's about how easy for them to navigate around the app and figure out where things are. And finally, personalization plays a big role in user uh, retention and, and having that features building. I think those are sort of the three categories that we um, you know, strongly recommend all partners pay attention to. And then finally, you know, least but not the you know, last one, but not the least one, is really think about all the form factors that you support. Mobile is not same as a connected TV. It's a different form factor. And the input method is not the same. So you need to design for this thing. So those are sort of the ways we think about a Druku user experience and user interface journey. Greg, can you talk about uh, from a metrological standpoint or maybe looking at the sort of more technological side of things, when you hear about these different user experience journeys, what role does technology play in, in enabling those? Yeah, I think you see kind of the maturity of the kind of the over the top business, you know, it used to be very, um, you know, stove pop, stove top centric and everything was just, you know, we do our own thing and, and we kind of figure out how that works. And, you know, you're dealing with huge creative forces and, you know, companies like HBO and Crunchyroll and, you know, they all have their ideas of how they want to present content and kind of the user journey and all of those other things. But when you get into the world of aggregation, a lot like what uh, we were talking about over at Roku, it's got to be this whole simplicity, right? And this whole idea of being able to intertwine all of those experiences into into a broader kind of um, um, search and discovery mode, right? It's you don't want to lose, uh, you know, all of the great work that's happening on the creative side, but you also don't want to lose, you know, really just kind of force people into into a single app at a single point in time because that's all they know. So from what we're saying is, um, you know, kind of up level, up leveling the user experience a little bit is, it's really how do you surface that content in a way that gives the user the ability to either discover new items to watch or to continue to stay up to date on the things that they're watching and, and really kind of integrate all of the data that's kind of wrapped around the content that's out there, whether it's really rich metadata and, you know, uh, CJ talked about windowing and all of these other types of things. How do you make that into a much broader experience and not just for app A or app B or app C, because as we're seeing the evolution of TV, right, we are seeing that it, it is it is veering into into a different direction than what we're used to. And, and that direction is all about surfacing content as a consumer of what I want to see, and then getting access to that content. And, you know, from a technology perspective, um, at least from a, from a metrological side of things, voice has been a, an enormous asset um, on the side, you know, in terms of remotes still aren't easy, you know, they're, you know, they're not the phones, they're not the, the, the tablets. And, and we, we find a lot of the kind of the quote app guys, you know, their DNA comes from a non TV based experience, right? And they're, and they're really programming for really fast twitch type of environments, uh, high performance type of environments. When you kind of open that up into a living room, you know, there are some limitations associated with that just from a historical standpoint. You know, I, I think we all hope that that's going to change, but, you know, there's, we, we all know the history of that. It, it takes a little bit of time for that to change. So we look at it from a technology side. How can we give the best experience uh, across the, the living room? And that's all about leveraging the creative that's out there from the apps guys, uh, bringing the ability to find the content that they want to watch and then making it easy for them to interact with that experience. So again, technology comes in voice, it comes in um, you know, targeted personalization, all of those types of things. And it's really matured dramatically. I think all of us on this, on this call can say two years ago, um, you know, other than Roku, Roku has been, been quote, kicking ass at this for, for quite a long time. But I think you see, you see you know, the major service providers now really focusing on, on what is the evolution of, of, of content and, 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 and engagement and consuming. And it's, you know, it's, it's, you're not losing your linear TV, but you are bringing a bunch of other stuff into that experience as well. So again, over the years, over the next couple of years, 
it's all going to be about the user experience. It's all going to be about the personalization. It's all about leveraging all of the creative that's happening at the at the at the content guys, right? Without losing without losing the subscriber, because I think now what we're finding is we're losing a lot of eyeballs and a lot of time because of confusion and because of because of uh, complexity. That's gonna that's gonna that's that's working its way out, and I think it's just only going to get better again with all of us kind of on this on this panel working together, leveraging best practices and and doing those type of things. It's it's neat. It's, it's a good place to be, especially from a technology standpoint. So thanks, guys. Well, and we're gonna we're gonna come back to uh, some of the things you just mentioned, including voice control, including uh, aggregating content, but. Uh, I want to talk specifically about user interface, and Tom, I'd like to start with you because I know that at, at Crunchyroll, you're undergoing a pretty major revision right now in your user interface, right? Um, how often should services change their user interfaces and experiences? I mean, I know on the creative team, on the creative side of things, of course, you're always looking at ways to make it better and make improvements and and either iterate or make a um, a major change, but you also have to keep in mind customer comfort with what's already there, right? Yeah, and you, I could say you're lucky as a company that you live long enough to be able to need a major revision, be able to execute on it. I would say that it, it really comes down to at what point do you feel that your either interface or your technological support is preventing you from being able to meet your customers' expectations in of itself. That with Crunchyroll, the effort was really around, can I get content to the users on whatever device they're using, whether that be web, whether that be mobile, and whether that be living room. And that for a time, we were able to mostly be able to do that. Um, but then we started to run into challenges in terms of being able to not only scale to, to meet the growing audience and growing demand for anime itself, but also be able to meet some of those additional requirements around the content itself, like being able to have more discussions around episode, episodes themselves or be able to better find users and be able to share your passion there. And that you eventually come to a point where you need to understand how do you really go about supporting these changes and how do you actually start building a roadmap to be able to execute upon that. For Crunchyroll itself, we're in, you know, we're in the kind of the last leg of um, updating our experiences, this one specifically web, but that we've been working since 2018 to change things across the board, whether that be a living room or whether that be mobile as well. But again, a lot of that precipitated on the fact that we need to make sure that we can satisfy the bare minimum requirement, which is being able to play back video reliably and as quickly as possible, but also then be able to take it beyond the user's expectations in order to be able to help them better engage and share their fandom with a wider audience. Yeah, and one of the things, obviously, this is possible on the web in ways that it's not possible uh, with the other devices, but I noticed when I went to Crunchyroll, I think last week or the week before, it asked me if I wanted to try out the new interface, right? Um, I believe that was Crunchyroll, and if it wasn't, I apologize. But, you know, I was able to then say, no, I want to stick with what I'm used to, or yes, I'd like to try out this new, uh, the new interface. Um, CJ, any follow-up on that? I, I actually think you're on to something, Eric, and in my opinion, the question is a little bit less about how often and more about how you do it. Um, and if you're able to do it mindfully, small tests and, and make your decisions in a data-driven way, um, I think your users will, will be pretty forgiving about the changes that you're making. So what am I saying? Um, starting off with hypotheses that you can validate and A-B tests. So I, I think maybe my navigation should have four type of top line options instead of three. Well, that's something that's very easy to validate in the market. You grab 10% of your users, you share with them that four item um, experience. And then after you decide what your KPIs are, you track that as it compares to the, the rest of the world. There are other 90% who received no different treatment. Um, assuming your KPI impacts sort of bear out the hypothesis of, I'll just, I, I'm looking to elevate my movies catalog. So maybe I pull movies out of navigation and put that top line 
well, then what did I see happen to my impressions on the movie's landing page? Did I see playback ratio and ultimate you know, time on site and ultimate content consumed go up based on that hypothesis? If so, all good. Um, one thing I would say before rolling that out, from a tech strategy perspective, either working to make sure all of your changes are backwards compatible, or otherwise you find yourself in a place where you might be releasing certain things on certain platforms. And if you have other users that haven't sort of stayed up to date on the upgrade path, you might find yourself at a, at a gate where you can't continue bringing everyone else along with you because you're supporting older versions. So making sure that your test and learn strategy is also really informed and is partnering with either elegant fallbacks, backwards compatibility, or really mindful forced upgrade um, cadence is, is key to making sure you're sort of creating as little disruption as possible and still remembering, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze? Would the user go to the app store and download it again? You know, maybe need to wait until they're on what? If you're truly shipping a ton of value, yes. You know, there's always gonna be people who don't want to update. Um, older devices just, you know, don't move my cheese. But for the vast majority of use cases, if you're delivering value, you're doing it mindfully and you're trying to do it while minimizing disruption, I think you go for it. Yeah, I've got a comment on that. I think um, I think it's really important that you know your customer when you start to go through a lot of this UI adaptation, right? I think if you look at the demo for like a Crunchyroll, that's a completely different demo than if you're, you know, uh, I don't know, HCTV or something to that effect, right? Where you really need to understand that that change is hard for a for a lot of the demographics, right? And and you can begin to lose customers when you do that. I, you know, I don't, you know, I remember back in the days with, you know, with the Time Warner and the HBO and the new, the VOD stuff, which was the greatest thing in the world. But, you know, we look back on, we look back on the the UI on that and these popsicle sticks and we all look at it and you're, are you kidding me? But, um, you know, there was that, there was that, that, um, that controlled and experience that people really understood and start, started, you know, really liked. And I, I also revert back to even the grid guide, right? I mean, look at the grid guide on an EPG. That's still whatever happens to be people like that for, and if, you know, as, as often as we've tried to get rid of that thing, right? It, it's one of the number one complaints, bring that back, bring it back. Right. And we all try to incorporate it. So, um, you know, again, as we, as we all kind of, evolve with what all this stuff is and our customers kind of evolve with us. Um, it's really um, important for us to understand our customers so we don't alienate them. And I think there is a lot of data that, you know, that, that proves that if you do something without really understanding what your customer's response is going to be, you know, they, I, what, I'm out, right? And then you've got, then you've got, then you've got all new customer acquisition again. And that's, that's, you know, as we all know on this call is one of the hardest things in the world to do. So keep your customers close keep them happy, you know, make it again, make it easy. And all of this other stuff is, 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 uh, you know, kind of comes with it. And then the whole value proposition kind of rolls itself into all the neat little things we can do. And, and it, again, it's that little walk besides the run step. So again, just from a, from a perspective, from a guy that's aggregating a whole bunch of uh, content into, in the, in, in the certain areas, uh, I love the leap, before, you know, jump before you, you uh, what's that? I don't know how to describe Look it. Look before know? you leap. Look before you leap. Thanks very Look much. before you run. Syndrome. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, what? Look, we're, we're a new, tight, fun, content-driven in industry, and, and a lot of us get really excited real quick, and we, we want to do something, and then all of a sudden, wait, why didn't that work? So I think, again, that um, our fundamental principles on, on almost everything is really understand what your customer is be able to define what the value proposition is both in the near term and long term and everything else kind of shakes itself out. I, I think, you know, you guys hit upon all points, right? <clears throat> Incremental is good, um, you know, versus big bang. And every change you bring in has a learning curve for consumers, right? And you need to be very cognizant of that fact and doing it slowly with AB tasks, uh, leverage platform capabilities around it is very crucial when you think about it. And, as Tom mentioned, there is no hard and fast rule about how many times you need to make change. I think it's just that it's purely, I think some of the big changes are driven by much outside than you are usually rebranding, marketing efforts, et cetera. You have to let that happen, but at the same time, you make sure that you've done enough homework before rolling out these changes. We've talked a little bit already about content and app fragmentation. Um, and with so much content out there, so many apps, 
so many different types of content, right? You've got premium OTT services, you've got these so-called niche services, and I uh, moderated a panel about niche services later, and we're everyone's trying to move away from that term, right? Because niche just means you're really super serving a, a passionate audience. Um, and, uh, and also then you add local content in on top of it. There's a lot to keep track of and a lot to, to bring under one roof. So, so Greg, what are some of the best practices there and how can service providers seamlessly integrate all of that together? Magic, it's all ah. magic. Um, <laughs> I, I honestly, I mean, that's a really, that's, that's, that's the challenge, right? I mean, you know, from our standpoint, from a technology guy, we're all about trying to, um, to bring, make it easier for people to bring content on board for the experience. Right. And that's, you know, historically, that's always been really difficult to, uh, you know, bring new content on and, and, and kind of offer it up technologies and platforms, you know, Roku is a great example of this. Now, you know, it's, it, it doesn't take multiple years to get things on for people to watch any longer. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that's always a good thing, but you know, with the aggregation and, and, and uh, that's, that's happening. And then the consolidation, which everybody can see every single day. Right. Um, and then you get, you get all the subscription fatigue. And so I think, you know, there's a, a couple of things that need to happen. One, Again, it's you, you've got to have that stickiness with your customer, and you've got to have that that you know that, that personalization that really wants me as a consumer to come back and 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 you know the HBOs of the world are actually you know providing shows that I want to watch. I mean that's their biggest challenge, right? I think that's you look at some of the other OTT guys are how do you keep things fresh because people are churning and burning all of the time. So and it's not hard, right? It's really not hard to churn and burn. So you've got to have you've got to have fresh, new, and interesting content in a way. Um, that can be serviced and, and sticky, right? I think that's as, as a CSP, that's kind of their role. My role as a, from a technology person is really kind of keeping everything tied together and making it easier for one to find that content. Again, whether it's through technology and search and, and, and recommendation and, you know, rich metadata that, that surface things up, partnering with the, or the CSPs and kind of understand their strategy and, and start to look at different ways to position content and, you know, there's this whole concept. It's not old, new, but it's there's not, it, but it's very old. You know, shelf space management, right? You walk through the grocery stores, and you know, the most premium, valuable piece of uh, merchandise is that eye level piece of con or piece of, you know, cereal that's sitting right there. Those type of things are starting to happen in the in the TV ag aggregation space as well. Whether it's through monetization, and that's a premium spot that people are paying for, whether it's through advertising, through all of these different things, but it comes right back to kind of the ability to understand your customer at a personal level, maybe, maybe not necessarily one-on-one, -on -one, but pretty close. So you're delivering the content that they want to see, right? You're keeping it fresh. And then you're just, you're, um, you're, you're, you're giving um, the operators and the, and the content service providers easy ways to bring on their content. And again, that's not very easy when you start dealing with um, kind of legacy stuff in the back end and, and you've got some all kinds of, requirements that that you know all of us don't want to have to realize that are there but that, that are there because i know that cj and tom because they can bring some unbelievable kick-ass content right but unfortunately not every, every device out there can uh, can can display that so you've also got to make sure that you keep that in mind as well so again i think i think we're seeing what we're seeing this this you know there used to be this cowboy kind of approach where everyone's kind of going off doing their own thing and trying to get their own thing done. And, and again, as we start to mature, um, you know, there's lots of conversations. You, you see Roku guys have a, a really um, comprehensive partner program and, you know, those type of things where people are now kind of bringing everybody into the umbrella. How can we make it better? How can we work better together? Whether it's through billing, you know, search and discovery, surfacing, all of those things. So again, I, I was a little facetious on magic, but it's, it, it takes a lot to, to make sure that that all of this kind of happens because it's not all just flipping the switch and, and you're, and you're there to go, but it's getting there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just, just um, adding to that, I think the consumers before watching TV, right? It's, it's through streaming experience for a reason because it gives them that power to curate that experience. So that has led, what that means is there is underlying so many services and they want to be able to pick and choose what they want, when they want to watch it. And that has essentially means that there is lots of different services that cater to that need. Um, 
while fra- you know that led to fragmentation that does exist in the market you know as as you know roku as a platform essentially has you know done a phenomenal job as as sort of um um greg called out i think in in collating the, all that experience you know with our roku platform as well as on the roku channel um it, the fragmentation on varying price points and collating and giving ability for our consumers to get major services on a single platform and pay through once that single platform and creating that search and discovery experience across multiple services is sort of is how we uh, provide that you know usability aspect to the consumers And then, All right. Uh, go ahead. I was, I was also going to just add on to what Greg and uh, Sharana had also mentioned earlier about understanding the modality that the user is coming to consume your content as something to keep in mind in terms of trying to walk a very fine balance between keeping experiences and terminology and iconography the same so that it does feel like a cohesive brand across the different types, but that each platform does have their own type of you know, uniqueness and individuality that you need to make sure that you accommodate for when you actually build out these experiences. For example, if I'm building for a you know, iOS device versus a Roku device, very different screens, very different contexts, you know, different, different platform capabilities when it comes to search and to pricing or billing options there. But that ultimately, you know, going, going back to the you know, term you know, great use of magic, it's, it's a lot of blood, not blood, uh, sweat and uh, work to be able to be mindful of that in terms of how do you architect user interfaces and not only that, but also the backends that power them to be able to make sure that you're delivering a solid core experience across any specific touch point, but that you also allow that type of flexibility and design to be able to understand what makes a Roku device shine and really appeal to a Roku centric user compared to let's say an Android user or a web user to make sure that the application while still feeling like something like Crunchyroll feels like it was actually tailor made for that device. I'd like to dig down into some specific features and functionality uh, right now. Um, and I guess the first question is, I'll start with CJ. Uh, can you talk about the relative importance of data-driven versus human curated recommendations? And obviously HBO Max, I think is a good place to start with that because you've got your, I believe it's called curated by humans. Uh, we call it recommended by humans. Recommended by humans, yes. It's interesting you ask, and I promise this isn't a hedge, but it's such a clear and and not an or for me. Um, if you think about how you really optimize a machine learning model, um, unless it's unsupervised learning, which is super sophisticated, we can talk about that later. You need humans to help the machine understand what is actually a good outcome and a bad outcome. Um, so one of the things that we do at HBO Max as far as having these editorially curated select, uh, collections, and then our machine learning algorithm helps marshal those sort of in mass to different editorial segments or cohorts or, or a different viewer on a different viewing occasion. Um, it's really a beautiful blend of that, you know, that, that gut feeling of a subject matter expert in, in their field you know, of cinema with the way that algorithms can help us sort of really mindfully test and then scale into meaningful, statistically significant results. Um, even looking at those results that come from your A-B test, more times than not, you need partnership with your editorial team, your product team, and your data team to make sense out of them. Um, very rarely have I seen A-B test results just be unambiguously, yes, go do this, or pivot and don't. I think there's always a little bit of, of your gut and, and kind of that magic that we were talking about that helps you land that plane. Um, recommended by humans is, is one thing that you highlighted. We're starting to think about testing into a space of, you know, actual people delivering these recommendations in a video to really bring you a little bit more close to that authentic experience that we're trying to trying to communicate. Um, at HBO Max, it's really all about going from a place where you're, 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 you have more data 
than just that two by three box art. This isn't Blockbuster or Arrows anymore. Like we have video, we have commentary, we have multimedia content that we can wrap around that decision to click play on a two by three poster. Um, and sort of that human feedback that may come from your friends and a social network. It may come from other influencers or, or people in, in the industry that you trust, we think are one of many tools that we are going to start testing over time uh, to figure out how we can ultimately create more confidence when a user hits play. I 100% agree with CJ in terms of the, the need for both rather than one over the other. That especially for people given taking anime, for example, who are new to the medium itself, there's a lot you can do in terms of being able to programmatically help them along in terms of being able to take what they've watched, provide timely recommendations and get them introduced to new content. But you also have an audience which is very much ingrained in the anime industry as a whole. And they already know nine months before a particular series has even you know debuted on television or streaming services that it is either going to be the best thing to watch or the worst thing to watch and that for anime fans in general we want to encourage them to be able to share their expertise with others given that this is a highly participatory community in terms of being able to share their passion with one another and that what we need to focus on as a company a crunch role is being able to elevate those voices in constructive and inclusive ways to be able to share that expertise and that passion with a wider audience so that it's not just an editorial team or just ml but it's also just the community as a whole being able to share why these 10 series are the best examples of sports and anime or even more in-depth analysis in terms of the you know things coming down to specific directors or even specific key animators that they feel really resonate with this particular audience. I think, you know, you know um, what, what we feel is that, you know, as, as both CJ and Tom said, both are important. However, some of the use cases lend themselves to either data-driven or a human curation. For example, you know, if you are putting together a homepage, personalized homepage, data-driven AI-based or ML-based probably is much better there because it scales better as well as you can um, uh, essentially put together those things faster. However, when it comes to trending topics or something that Tom mentioned, it's much more better we do a, a human curated because that involves much more wisdom, more variables than a human uh, uh, AI can take input on. So, it's both, I think, some of the use cases land better on in one case or the other. Now, Greg, you had mentioned voice earlier, uh, and I'd like to get everyone's thoughts on how important voice control is right now and voice input, and do any of you have any data showing how many customers are using it? Well, that is a that's a that's an interesting question around data. Uh, I can't share that, but I can say yes. Yeah. There, it is the number one feature um, that is being leveraged in in the systems that we are part of that have been deployed. It just is a, you know, again, it it takes. Um, I think it's it's that initial jump into the feature, but once you kind of adopt it into the feature and embrace it, it's really really valuable, and it's it's becoming even more valuable as you start seeing the 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 voice across multiple content services, right? Whether that happens to be different apps or different linear or whatever that happens to be. Again, as you start to integrate all of these different services, and I think um, you know uh, maybe not coming from from Crunchyroll or or HBO, but as, as you know the platforms that are out there, the ability to integrate that, those features across all of that content is just very, very relevant and very important. Um, so, I, you know, again, I think it, it does a lot of things for, you know, one, obviously it gets you away from the, 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 the awful remote. And again, I'm just speaking about the living room and the TV set in the living room. You know, that remote is not adapt for doing a lot of different things other than going up and down and maybe entering a couple of numbers that in and with the introduction of voice has really made a, a made a, a huge difference i i think as we kind of go move forward along this kind of paradigm with with content some other technologies that we're going to start seeing that that are important are going to be um subscription management i think is is, is going to be important there are so many different 
uh, content offers out there right now. And we as consumers, for the most part, um, you know, Roku does a pretty decent job of this and some of the other platforms do, but, you know, we as consumers are responsible for the most part of, of the subscription management side of things and, and whether we, you know, keep the subscription, you know, churn the subscription, those side of, I think you're going to see technology that's going to help manage that a little bit more. Password management across all of these different apps, I think, are going to be really important. Uh, you know, obviously, you get into a bunch of different privacy issues around that. But those are the types of um, requests that we're getting from the consumer base on, you know, again, make it easy. Well, you know, we're making it as easy as possible to consume the content and to find the content. Make it e as easy as possible to help me as a consumer manage the content as well. I think it's kind of that next step. And there's a lot of different technology players that, out there that are trying to address this. And I think, again, it's, it's, all about, it's all about making things easier. Voice makes it easier. And so some of these other technologies will, will tend to drive itself as well. Greg, I, I think you're right about that. And I, I think of voice in a few different sort of phases, if you will. Right now, for, for something like HBO Max, because we know CTV is our prime viewing occasion, because we know keyboard input just is terrible. Um, that's really the primary use case there is, can we just find an accelerator to another experience challenge we have? Um, as I start to think about nailing that use case where voice can go later, um, you know, a, a use case of one, I'm slowly starting to talk to more things in my house now. I have a Google Nest Hub, I've got Alexa, there's Siri somewhere. Like when I lose my phone and I know it's just between the couch cushions, I ask Siri where it is and it starts ringing, right? So to think about that conversational tone becoming more aligned with your entertainment service, um, HBO actually just released uh, the beginning of an Alexa skill that'll start to take you down that path of figuring out what you should watch tonight by being able to ask some questions um, using, you know, kind of your, your standard IMDB metadata, if you will, and getting some call and response back. But, you know, as a, as a Trekkie and a Star Trek fan back in the 90s, I just think of people being like, computer, and he has this, you know, three-minute conversation, and there's pivots and directions and decision trees, and he ends up with an answer. That's really not that far down the road once we sort of stitch together um, the really sort of improvements in natural language processing, and then how that search engine algorithm, which really could be the same search engine algorithm that you would use if you're typing in, starts to disambiguate the queries and serve things up to you in a progressive way. So I, I think it's, it's starting at a very tactical solution to a very painful problem, but has so many cool applications, even thinking about biometrics. Would I love to not have a profile picker when someone starts up their app? Well, if I can do that by understanding either who was the person who asked Alexa or Siri or Google to open the app, and then is there just some other amount of ambient noise around that I can impute who's watching at that viewing occasion, um, could absolutely send our ability to, to recommend content and understand what user's preferences are um, through an absolute reflection point. So. No, I think that, that's a great point, CJ. I know from the mothership perspective here, you know, you, you, you look at kind of the kind of the aging population and the whole smart home and how does that integrate into, you know, the next, you know, X number of years, the next 20 years or so. And, you know, whether it's integration into devices or into services or just, you know, all I do think I do totally agree with you. You're going to see kind of the things that we do with the TV set and the things that we do with personalization kind of adopt itself and start to flow this much broader in-home thing. Um, and I think all we can call it is a thing right now because it's, it's so nebulous right now, and we'll see where it just kind of shakes out. But I think I that's totally, what we call totally it. Internet of Things. <laughs> they are, uh, that is, that actually, is true, right? Wow. <laughs> we're brilliant. How about that? Why do you think we're on these panels? Right? Write that one down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think when it comes to voice controls, uh, at least where I've seen it, is that the the simple problems when solve the simple problems can be solved well, and when it gets solved well, it's magic. Where I've seen some challenges specifically with the work that we've done around Crunchyroll is that especially around trying to find content, I, I haven't seen the, the machine learning really catch up in terms of how users would search for content. Some content doesn't get translated. So if you ask to watch Showa again, Roku, Raku, Shinju, which I know this entire like audience has watched and has fallen in love with, um, you, you have challenges in terms of systems understanding what you're trying to find and how to actually search for that. You also have content with very wordy titles. Like I've been killing slimes for 300 years and maxed out my level. 
and that many people in the community find specific like nicknames or shortcuts for a lot of these titles and that there's a part of an expectation with them that that's the way they should be able to search just because that's how the community has discussed this as well. So there is some complexity that we need to think through in terms of, again, meeting that user experience and getting to that delight factor where we just know what the user is talking about, even if they're not giving us the full amount of information to be able to find it. Yeah, again, you know, going back to the data part of it, um, Eric, I think we can see that significant population uses it, it's increasing. And we also, wherever we can, can track back to the voice users versus non-voice users and um, essentially can see that these users are more engaged, has better retention, and essentially in thus generating a quite a bit of additional ARPU for content partners. So it's a very important stuff, partners should pay. I, I, and as Tom mentioned, it doesn't cover all use cases, but it's important to pick specific use cases and then work with the platforms to do it. We've touched on this a little bit, uh, particularly with the uh, the question about data driven versus, and again, it shouldn't be versus data driven and human driven uh, recommendations. But I want to talk a little bit more about search and discovery, uh, particularly. And let's start with you, Greg. What techniques do you see super? Uh, to, do you see service providers who are super aggregators using to help surface content, help users find that content? Well, the first challenge is getting rights to that the rights to that data, right? So that needs to be solved, number one, uh, and that's it's a lot easier said than done, right? I mean, I think it's again, you know, that metadata has such value to you know so many different parties within the ecosystem, and I think um, one to figure out a way to extract that, you know, extract that where it can be leveraged, and I I, I still think there's there's a lot of these. Um, um, you know, dead ends out there for, for lots of different reasons. But I, you know, the key is getting a hold of, of, of as much rich metadata as possible. So you can start to integrate that into very, very comprehensive search and recommendation options. I think that, you know, you, you, you run into some roadblocks sometimes on that. And again, I don't think it's a tech, not, most of the time, not a technical roadblock. I mean, again, you know, my engineer friends always say everything can be solved through technology and engineering, which is true. But I mean, at the, at the end of the day, um, you know, there's still some of these other things that we need to address and just kind of get this massive pile of data and, you know, the big, the big data words and all of these other things, it really comes down to making sure you have access to really rich data with the content you're trying to serve. And then, and then, and then having the ability, whether it's through automation or through most, most of it through automation, be able to surface the content that's important to me. And that, you know, that can be based on, you know, viewer behaviors or profiles or all of those other things. So, you know, all that technology is there and it's, and it's growing and it's maturing. And, and again, I think we're seeing um, other things such as contextual content and contextual data that's starting to drive and surface other things that might not, you know, might not normally be uh, interrelated, but, uh, you know, that type of technology is starting to happen. And again, if we can break some of the barriers on, on getting hold of the content, and again, I'm not saying that's easy because there's a lot of commercial value to all of this stuff, right? And intellectual value. So um, we'll get there. I think uh, the consumer is going to force it, right? And um, and uh, so I, again, I think the um, the approach of having more personalized content recommended to you um, is, is happening. The ability just to simply ask for some of that content will again bring better better searches. Some of the um, prioritization issues that come up in terms of if there are, you know, eight titles that are available in eight different sources, how do you rank those sources on how do you watch that title? Those type of things are also going to kind of flush itself out. And to me, again, that's all about economics and monetization. And, and I think that's going to kind of shake itself out over the, over the next couple of years. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, I, the, the um, ability to surface the content is very limited right now. It's going. It's 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 getting better. It's, and and obviously Roku actually does a great job of it. Fire's doing. Or Amazon's doing a pretty good job of it right now. So I mean, I think you're going to see that mature across the board. Comcast does. I got to put a plug in for Comcast. Comcast does a really good job of that. So anyway, that's uh, that's uh, we'll we'll see how it shakes out. But the the, the research and recommendation engines of the past are getting much better. Yeah. 
I think, you know, that's a good point. I think search and discovery, I think it's one is search and discovery of the content itself, but in this in our era of everyone coming up with their own channel or an app, you need to also be able to go in front of the users. How do you do that? I think at, at Roku, we have a much more robust activation process. It is like a wizard where we ask questions and based on the responses, we build up a set of channels that um, personalizes for them. And that's a great um, way to start um, becoming discoverable. You know, we have seen three to five times install versus an organic install if they do that. And then once they activate the device, we have certain features called featured free um, or other stuff where they can participate and be discoverable there as well. Um, as, as Greg mentioned, search and discovery in the local sort of the platform format is a very important aspect. The more metadata you're gonna to provide to platforms or get to platforms, I think they become more discoverable because it becomes part of the recommendation and personalization logic. So that's what, you know, one way for content owners to think about. And, you know, I think Tom made some good points in terms of the whole social aspect of it. You know, we all talk about the integration of social media and social networks into content viewing and all these other types of things. I, you know, just one simple thing over the last year or so that, that I, I think most of the uh, major platforms, you know, the trending or what's, what are people watching now really starts to drive you know, immediately the consumer, I'll, I'll, I'll look at, the, you know, those top 10 and say, oh, you know, I might, I would have never thought about that and, and kind of gone and, 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 you know, check that show out or something to that effect. So those, those, those type of new services are, you know, whether it's through, I don't, you know, the, the I think Crunchyroll is a little bit different because they have such a, a, a very specific population of consumers and just so, so into the, into the content technology, social networks a little bit different. But if, if you look at a much broader kind of a much broader uh, platform that's got multiple types of content, um, you know, the, the ability for me to say, oh, you know, someone, someone's watching X, it just gives me that uh, motivation to maybe check it out. Just like the water cooler, right? It's the water cooler conversation. You go there, oh, what'd you watch last night? I watched, you know, whatever, Mad Men, or I watched something on Crunchyroll or something like that. If you can start to automate that, you're seeing it now. So that's, that's good. HBO does a good job of that with their assets too. I'd like to close by coming back to CJ's analogy earlier that uh, uh, of, of UX as the castle in which the king or queen of content sits. So if, if UX is the castle, what should be in the dungeon? What doesn't work, but that people some that, but that some services still cling to anyone want to jump in on that? Is this being recorded? <laughs> yes, it is. So if that affects yeah, so your no answer, then okay, no one's going to say anything, no, no, right? No, no comment. No comment. <laughs> Add metadata should be in the dungeon. Because okay. I think one theme that we've, we've all sort of touched on at some point is that your platform and your distribution methods can only be as effective as they can understand what they're serving, what they're clicking play on, what they need to be relating to other things in that ecosystem. Um, so having a great ontology and relationship of all of your widgets to each other and all of your users to all of those widgets, um, I think is really the, the most important thing that we need to elevate in the tower uh, while, while leaving some of the old dirty data practices of yore in the dungeon. I'm not quite sure if dungeon is the right term, but I think <laughs> as, well, I'm more in the sense of like, I don't want to be very um, like morose, but like, you know, more like a graveyard in terms of doing different types of tests, A-B tests and finding out that, hey, we had a hypothesis. We thought that by doing X, we were going to see some type of different either engagement with members or engagement with content, but we didn't see that. That was a nice test. Let's kind of move forward and move on from there. That it's, it's one where the dungeon kind of seems like a very risky jump for anyone to take in terms of something was so horribly that bad and so massive that we must find a special place in our castle to go bury it so it can never be seen again versus taking a more incremental mindset in terms of being okay with do running tests, having smaller failures, but because you're treating the jumps more incremental as opposed to very massive, there's less consequence in terms of discovering something new and being able to iterate closer towards where you want to go within, I guess, your kingdom. If we're going to keep this, this kingdom metaphor going. 
All right. Unfortunately, we have to wrap. Uh, so you're off the hook, Greg. Um, thank you so much. This has been a great discussion. We are back in a half hour with a discussion about uh, the great OT rebundling. Is that on the way? Thanks so much, everyone. And thanks again to Signiant for helping make all this possible. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. When the director calls action. And action. When the game is on. It's good. Or it's time to save the universe again. Media Shuttle is there. Trusted by more than 25,000 media companies, Media Shuttle delivers, making it easy and secure to send any size file anywhere fast. The journey begins with Media Shuttle portals, customized and branded for any project and designed to be so easy, your end users will love it. All while giving operations teams complete control through a simple yet powerful admin interface. Add users, set permissions, customize file delivery specs, and report on all activity. Blast off with proprietary acceleration technology. Media Shuttle moves your content anywhere in the internet connected world at hyper speeds. Along the way, your files are protected. Our commitment to enterprise grade security has made Media Shuttle a preferred tool with Hollywood studios, major sports leagues, broadcasters, and more. With Media Shuttle, your files are never handed over to Signiant. File movement is orchestrated between the end user's workstation and your storage, whether on-prem or in the cloud. Your IT team simply provisions your storage, connecting it to the Media Shuttle cloud service, and Signiant handles the rest. Get started on your Media Shuttle journey today, a journey without limits.